Hey, fanboy nation. This is your pal Daffy Duck, and you're watching. You're watching. We're watching. You're watching. Fanboy. 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 A fanboy, etc. Fanboy nation. Dot. I assume. Dot. Um. <laughs> This afternoon, I am speaking with documentarian Sky Fitzgerald about his Critics' Choice nomination for Hunger Ward, uh, the tragedy of what's going on in Yemen due to the war with Saudi Arabia. Sky, how are you today? I'm doing great. Nice to, nice to be here. Pleasure's mine. Um, it's interesting to see Yemen go from a, uh, a particularly first world country, uh, one and a half, we'll say, to uh to being bombed into the third century for the past you know six seven years by the saudis um initially funded by the obama administration which no one for some reason wanted to talk about and ignored by the brits and the french and even sort of had a blind eye turned to them by other gulf states um what was your first interest in making the documentary about the starving children in Yemen? And how did you first become aware of the situation over there? Ooh, there's a lot to unpack there, huh? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I'd been aware that, um, uh, you know, of the conflict in Yemen <clears throat> for, for many years, but I didn't know the extent to which uh, the U.S., um, Britain, France, UAE, and of course the Saudis were involved. Um, and so I started doing due diligence and started researching it. And, you know, once I discovered the extent to which um, our tax dollars here in the U.S. are going to support, um, you know, bombing runs that are indiscriminate in some cases and clearly human rights violations and acts of, um, you know, indiscriminate war crimes, I, um, I, I couldn't turn away from it. And um, I also learned pretty quickly that the, the famine that the country has been on the brink, on, brink of for years is largely human made. And um, that was deeply disturbing to me. And uh, the goal with the film really has been to try to illuminate um, the consequences of this war in Yemen on civilians. Um, you know, the fact that that a child in 2020 can die of starvation, literally, is horrific, right? Uh, it certainly is in my mind, and I think it's something that we ought not to allow as a global community. Um, I would be lying to you if I said I am absolutely numb to this situation, because my family is from the Middle East, so I am used to this like, you know, it's turning on the sink and getting a glass of water. Uh, but I would also be remiss to say I would be absolutely heartless if I didn't feel for these children. And so it's this weird dichotomy of like, yeah, I know it's going on because I've seen it my entire life and still wanting to help the kids. Um, what, I, what I've also noticed, and it seems very strange, um, you know, we've, we've had our political situation here, and I don't care if you're on the left or the right, that, that doesn't bother me. But what does bother me is that because someone is aligned with a certain political view, um, everything from that side is completely dismissed. And, well, they're suffering, but this guy's on my team. So, oh, well, but if it was on the other team, then I'd make a ruckus. And, and that's the thing that really kills me. Um, you witnessed this firsthand, you've seen these poor children in the hospital and the lack of supplies that they have. You know, Yemen was not a starving country before this civil war. I'm sorry, not this civil war, this neighboring war. Uh, Yemen was not an impoverished country till, till this happened. Yemen, I mean, still had strict Muslim values, but it had a Jewish community as well. It has immigrants from Ethiopia because it's only like six, seven miles uh, you know, across the peninsula. Uh, that people don't realize. And thank you for so, showing the heterogeneous community of Yemen. But why are we so dismissive for the you know, piss poor actions for people that are on our team and willing to chastise people on the opposition? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a fair question. You know, as you've, as you've sort of hinted at, 
you know, the, the conflict that's ongoing in Yemen that's supported by the Saudi coalition, you know, um, has been supported in different ways by both the Obama administration and the Trump administration. And it's taken different forms during both, but it has been supported regardless, nonetheless. And during both those periods, of course, um, you know, the, the famine has increased and gotten worse. And, you know, my, my take is that, you know, regardless of your political beliefs, as you've noted, the fact is we, anyone should be horrified by um, indiscriminate killing of children, which is happening right now, regardless of what your political beliefs are, whether you're on the left or the right. You know, there, there are certain things that just are, in my mind, completely universal, right? You know, um, the suffering of a child, right? I think we would probably agree is something that we all ought to care about, right? And when the suffering of that child through lack of basic nutrients is human caused and can be resolved by our political decisions, it ought to be. And that's the case in Yemen. You know, humans started this war and humans can stop it. And um, you know, that's our goal with the film is to try to marshal resources and action towards getting people engaged um, and more educated about the U.S.'s involvement in the war and how we can stop it. And it's not the, just the U.S. I mean, again, we mentioned France, we mentioned Britain. Germany has turned a blind eye, and Germany has been involved in trying to get the Armenian and Christian genocide recognized of 1915. Sweden has done the same thing. Um, so it, it's really strange to see the world that's tried to help other communities ignore Yemen. And like, you know, you mentioned this in the documentary, and we've been talking about this. This is a man-made famine. You know, it's not like Ethiopia in the 80s, which was a tragedy, but that was, excuse me, that was climate. You know, that was lack of resources. That was drought. That was, you know, a natural cause of famine, which is still a horrible thing. But when it's man-made, it's absolutely more intensified and can be stopped, which makes it far worse. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think one of, one of you know, I think one of the things we can we can challenge ourselves on is why why is this known as the forgotten war, right? As 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 you're referring to, it's not something that gets a lot of notice or traction here in the West. And you know, um, I'm driven by by the name Madel Hassani, Nabil Al Kwati. You know, I I, I name them because Adele is a Yemeni filmmaker and journalist who's been in prison for the last two months for doing his job and trying to get a story out that the local factions and de facto authorities didn't want out. Nabil al Kwati, who I worked with when I was there filming, was shot dead on his front step in June because he was trying to get a story out that the local authorities didn't want out. So, you know, this is the space that, that I often try to fill with these short human rights films. You know, Yemen is a country in conflict, right? And journalists and filmmakers on the ground are under incredible duress to get their stories out within, without being imprisoned or killed. And so I, um, on this story, I, I tried to fill a space as an ally with, with Adele and with Nabil and, and many others who are having an incredibly difficult and dangerous time getting this sort of narrative out of the country. Right, and, and our goal is to try to fill that space and try to do it in as cinematic a way as possible so that you know, the story hopefully can have a more sustained lifetime um, and have some legs more so than just a, a, you know, a short news story would have. So that's, that's sort of the intent in terms of how we shaped it. Right, I, I was surprised that it was nominated for a short doc because it's, it's 40 minutes, so I think it makes makes it just under the cut of a full-length documentary. So, I, I mean, I understand, but, you know, the, this film was, was phenomenal. I want to ask something from the perspective of the right at this point. Um, we just had an election here in the United States. Uh, for better or worse, people have different opinions on the outcome. You know, I always tell people it's not extremes. It's 51, 48, depending which way it's ticking for those yeah. four years. Um, the right has been saying, and people have been calling them conspiracy theories, shadow bans, censoring, social media has been taking down posts. Whether they're conspiracy theories or whether they're absolute confounded lies, 
or even if there's some, you know, even if there are truth to them, people do, that they don't like that are being taken away. You've seen firsthand what censorship can do and how to silence the opposition in Yemen. How scary is seeing the beginning steps of that, which is deemed paranoia right now here, that could lead to something the way it has been in Yemen for years? Yeah, listen, it's deeply troubling um, to know that a close colleague um, has been tortured more than once for doing stories like Hunger Ward. Um, it wasn't in affiliation with our film that he was detained and tortured and continues to be detained. But, um, you know, uh, once I think you've um, experienced that and the danger of that, um, in a fractured system where there isn't a common truth and there isn't any accountability for the authorities. I think you see um, claims um, that aren't based in fact in a very different way. You know, um, I, I was trained to always go to the original source, right? And if you go to the original source and see with your own eyes and, and hear people's stories, you understand it on a deeper level on a more meaningful level that I think leads to um, action that can be more effective. So I, I very carefully vet my sources of information. And the first step for me always is, can I get to the original source? And I think, I think that, you know, I think there's a great need for media literacy in our country right now. I think what we've seen in terms of the fracturing of our demographics across political lines the last 10 years, really is a function of, to some extent, the failure of our education system to do a better job on media literacy. Um, so go to the source, you know, see with your own eyes, understand it firsthand. And I think there would be less, fewer keyboard cowboys and less um, misinformation. I mean, you know, I, I'd like to make the notion or I would like to make the decision for myself that person X is a crackpot or I could agree with person Y without someone trying to decide for me. Um, and that's the terrifying part. Like you, I'm from the old school, you know, journalistic, go to the source, three, three sources minimum, let's hear all sides if we can. Uh, let's try to be as unbiased as possible, even though our own personal biases are going to fill in there. Um, with your documentary, Hunger Ward, and you have a .org along with this, I believe the .org is hungerward.org. Yeah, that's right. Mistaken. Thank you. Um, when something like this happens, has there been an attempt, uh, not only on your life, but a way for other powers that be, especially financially secure nations, trying to shut you down with this? Or do they look at you and just dismiss you and go, oh, he's an outsider, he's an American, or he's Canadian, or you know, wherever you're from, and say ah, his opinion doesn't really matter because he's not one of us? Um, it's yet to be determined, yet to be seen, frankly. Um, you know, they're uh, you know operating in Yemen while we were filming is um, incredibly delicate, right? Because it's a conflict zone. It just is, <clears throat> and there, even though the conflicts front lines you know shift consistently in, in many parts of the country, um, you know uh, it is a conflict zone, and people are dying not just from airstrikes but from you know conflict on the ground itself. So that that danger is real, you know. But I think what you're, um, you know, what you're pointing to is a different kind of danger, right? The, the kind of danger having to do with the political weight of the conflict in Yemen. My hope is that, um, you know, the coalition that has been sort of supporting the continuance of the war in Yemen, including the U.S. and Saudi Arabia and UAE, and then, of course, France and Britain through the sales of arms and other countries, but those primary key players um, are, are getting tired, right? Are getting tired of this incredibly drawn out conflict that has been pretty static for some time. And despite the fact it's completely asymmetrical, right? You know, the, the Saudis have control over the skies, for example, and can bomb indiscriminately. You know, really the the factions have really fought to a standstill to some extent and and i what i hope is that in the coming days especially with the changing of the administration here is that um 
we'll, they'll find a way out, right? They'll, they'll, they'll find a way to say enough is enough. You know, the, the cost benefit analysis is not enough for us to continue. And I think that's, that's what all my colleagues in, in Yemen want for the most part. You know, it's like if you ask someone on the street of Aden or someone in Sana'a right now, you know, how this war can stop, to a T, they will say, if the foreign actors leave, we can solve this, right? And until the foreign actors leave, we can't solve this. That's what you're here. So that would be my hope. Yeah, well, it's, it's all of our hope at this point. Um, has anyone pinpointed the initial fuse that was lit that started this conflict? Uh, in what sense? Uh, between Yemen and Saudi Arabia. You know, I mean, the Saudis have more money. They have more military. They have more finances. They have more support than Yemen. I mean, Yemen wasn't a poor country. Yemen wasn't necessarily one of the richest oil countries. I mean, it was top 30, but it wasn't to the extent of Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, and, and the Gulf states. So, you know, what was the fuse that lit the conflict between the two that people are, are now saying? Because that seems to have been lost in translation and in reporting in the West. Well, as you, as you probably know, the, the common political narrative, you're right, is that this is a proxy war, right? It's a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran, right? Because the, the northern border of Yemen, you know, borders Saudi Arabia. And that, um, and that it's really, you know, Yemen is just being used as the, the proxy country to fight that war between those two countries only one of which is Sunni, of course. So, you know, that history goes much further back. Um, you know, my, my personal belief doesn't align directly with that. I think to some extent, it's really, um, if I were to harbor a guess, to a great extent, it's simply fear when the Houthis overran um, Sana'a by, uh, by the Saudi Arabias that um, they didn't want an aggressive party that wasn't Sunni running the largest city in the country because, you know, that's the north of the country which borders Saudi Arabia. So I think initially perhaps the war started out of fear after there was the internal conflict, you know, with the Houthis uh, uh, making a run and taking over the city. But of course it's expanded into far more than that. Um, but, you know, really very few people have gained from this war and so many hundreds of thousands have suffered. You know, you, you probably know the stats. It's you know, close to 5 million children in Yemen right now are at fear of dying of starvation in the coming months. That just, that fact ought not to exist on this planet. Why do you think that the world only starts caring when something happens in France? Like, Lebanon blew up because of mismanagement and the entire pier is gone and you know a, a quarter of beirut basically went you know a month and a half ago um you know and then there's the virus going on and then all of a sudden no one says anything then something happens in germany and you're like oh that's too bad but as soon as it hits france then the world loses it you know world war one oh well it was some serbian guy that that shot you know, an Austrian guy, you know, is uh, your friends, you know, Archduke Ferdinand. Oh, well, he's Austrian and it was a Serb. That's their problem. You know, Hitler wanted the Reinstag. He wanted part of Czechoslovakia. He, want, he went through Eastern Europe and Poland. Oh, no problem. The minute they got to France, then the world started taking notice. Why is France the catalyst for the world to take notice when all of this has happened? You know, Eastern Europe, uh, the Middle East, which is primarily Western Asia, North Africa, East Africa, why doesn't the world take notice until something happens in France? You know, um, I don't have the answer to that. And I think it's a great question. You know, uh, the, the irony of what you just asked is I have a colleague who's a director of photography um, from Lebanon. And, um, you know, he, he was there this summer when the explosion happened. And he just wrote me last week that he just temporarily <laughs> moved to Paris, ironically. Right. And so... Um, there, you know, I think my answer to the heart of your question is, is, is pretty simple. Um, I don't think it answers your question, but I think it's my answer to that, that dynamic, which does exist. And it's, it's, you know, that's what, 
how I'm trying to intervene in this film and in previous films that I've done, right? Why does a boat full of asylum seekers who drown off the coast of Africa not as important as something that happens in Stockholm or Paris, right? My view is it ought to be. My view is it's far more important in some ways, right? And with Hunger Ward, that's what we're trying to achieve, right? I mean, Dr. Aida and Aiden and Makia Maji, the nurse in the rebel held North are, they're heroes, right? I mean, they are doing incredibly difficult work behind the front lines of an incredibly dangerous conflict. And um, people just don't know about them and they should. And as an ally, I want to showcase these sorts of human beings that are doing absolutely unheralded work um, in very difficult circumstances that get no attention most of the time, right? But they're, they're doing the hard work of saving lives that I think we in the West ought to know about and care about. And it's not just the war. There, there's a global pandemic going on that they're suffering through. So now you have to save these starving, malnourished children in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a war, that everything's just falling apart around them. Um, Absolutely right. Yeah. And, and you know, we, we were fortunate to, um, to finish filming and then we, we got back to the U.S. about a month before the global pandemic really um, landed hard here in the US and so, um, but I've been in, in consistent contact with, with our colleagues in Yemen and you know, it's been devastating for them. Um, even though the statistics, the authorities don't really want the actual statistics to, um, to get out. You know, anecdotally, I can say that, um, you know, one of my colleagues lives by, um, around the corner from a graveyard in Aden. And he said that in, by the, by the middle of April, that the number of barrels had shot up tenfold um, from what their usual level was. So they're getting hit really, really hard. Um, as you noted, on top of all these underlying pressures caused by the war that already existed. So it's, it's been devastating for them. Um, your documentary had to be whittled down to 40 minutes, roughly. And you know this is a war that's been going on for over six years that people don't realize. Um, what was something that you really wanted to include in the documentary that unfortunately ended up on the cutting room floor because it just didn't fit into the narrative you're sharing? I mean, you know, you're not pushing an well, I, you're not pushing an agenda to just make the Saudis look bad. You know, you're telling the story of these Yemeni people. So where does you know something that you really wanted to include that just didn't fit into the documentary itself? Uh, the, that you wish you could have put in? It's a wonderful question. Um, because, you know, we did, we did have um, a lot of narratives that we covered um, and then, you know, we just didn't have space for or they didn't play out in the way that we thought we could use them effectively. Um, and, you know, just to speak about running time for a second, you know, I felt like we had a really good 60-minute film maybe but we couldn't make a really excellent 80 minute film. And so we're kind of in this middle zone and that's why we, we decided to go for the shorter distillation version of the story. But, but to speak to something I left out, um, Omeima, who is this wonderful 10 year old girl who we cover, who um, is being treated at Sadaka Hospital in Aden. Um, you know, she, when she was admitted to the hospital we show in the film that as a 10 year old, she weighed 25 pounds, which is you know, horrifying, right? I mean, I have a 10 year old boy and he weighs 93 pounds, I think, right? So as a father, as a filmmaker, I, I was absolutely horrified by that. And she became one of our participants in the project. And one of the wonderful things that we were able to witness was her treatment, but then also her discharge. And we were able to track and follow her home to her village in Northwestern Yemen um, and sort of capture the, re the reunion with her family. And that was just a beautiful, beautiful moment to see a young Yemeni girl recover, right? Um, and get healthier and then be rejoined with her family. And it just, because of how we shot it and the timing and the location, we just couldn't 
fit into the film, but it's really a beautiful scene. And on the bright side, now we have a bonus for the DVD feature. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, we are actually we are actually creating. We've already cut that uh, six or seven short pieces that we are going to put out to try to raise awareness not only about the film, but also in you know for a Western audience in particular. More, more understanding and knowledge um, that one, Yemen isn't just war, as you noted at the start of this conversation, um, but also just raise a general level of awareness and understanding uh, of Yemen in general. And we'll be releasing those in the next month or so, um, sort of in partnership with the film um, to target different audiences. We're also going to, I think, partner with IRC for some of that to make sure they get out to a completely different demographic as well. Uh, for people that want to contribute to your organization and to the film society itself, uh, where can they find you and where can they connect on social media so they have a, a place to go? Yeah, thanks for asking that. Um, so we have a, a, a website for the film. It's hungerward.org, so O-R-G. And on that, there's a, there's a get involved or a take action link. And, and there, um, we have partnered with um, a fiscal sponsor, um, and people can donate directly to the clinics that we showcase in the film. Um, so that's one way financially they can get involved that would have a direct impact on the doctors and the physicians and the nurses that you see in the film. And then there's also sort of a, a interventionist tool so that you can get involved to try to change um, government policy surrounding the war in Yemen. And, and so that's, that's another sort of engagement tool that people can, can uh, can make use of that we think is really, we're gonna ramp up in the coming months. Wow, just the fact that you have direct donation to the hospital without going through a middleman blows me away because you know we've always seen organization after organization after organization take their cut before whatever trickled down to the hospital or to the, the people yeah. that needed it and you going directly to the source and allowing people to donate to those hospitals is absolutely phenomenal and I commend you for that because that doesn't happen too often. Yeah. Yeah, we avoided going through like, you know, the World Food Program or any big organizations like that. Um, and there are some financial transaction costs, but they're very minimal. And so almost all the money is going directly to the doctors and the nurses to do the work that's so important. Fantastic. Uh, where do people find the documentary if they want to watch it? I know I got to see it because it's a four-year consideration for Critics' Choice. Um, it, it's one of the ones that we will be picking from and selecting to, to be nominated for the documentary awards. But as a general audience member, where can they go see Hunger Ward? Well, given the fact that cinemas are closed right now, it's difficult for any film, right? Trying to get seen right now um, that isn't it's sort of in the distribution, you know, um, pipeline already. But we are screening at Doc NYC um, starting on Wednesday. So you can go to the Doc NYC website and um, plug in Hunger Ward and it will come up and you can buy a ticket for the virtual screening there. And then also at Holly Shorts um, tonight at four or five o'clock, the film um, goes online. And so you can see it at two sort of uh, parallel film festivals on each coast this week and into next week. And then after that, um, we'll be posting where the film is going to be distributed in the coming months on our website, hungerward.org. Fantastic. Sky Fitzgerald, thank you so much for your time. Hunger Ward and hungerward.org uh, to go help the Yemeni people and, and see what travesties are going on in a man-made uh, famine, which is beyond me. Um, again, Hunger Ward, Hunger Ward W-A-R-D, sometimes I don't enunciate, en or enunciate enough, dot org. And Sky Fitzgerald, thank you so much for your time. Many thanks. My pleasure.